for those of you who weren't here this morning, I'm Lowell Bergman, and uh, I'm a professor of investigative reporting here at UC Berkeley. Um, I wanted to, because as some of you know, I'm in uh, my fifth decade of doing this kind of work, and so I think I have the prerogative of reflecting on the past and as well as the present. And I wanted to mention uh, before we get started that when I first got involved in television news, which was back in 1978, I was very nervous about uh, getting involved at all because those of us who were in print thought of people in television as people who just took our print stories and put pictures in them or just did sensationalized stories uh, that really didn't have any news value to them. So I was very nervous that if I got involved in the business, uh, I would, in a sense, taint my reputation. Now, by the way, at that point, I had already been sued for $800 million in various lawsuits involving a variety of people. So it wasn't a question of whether or not someone questioned my integrity, but whether I could look myself in the mirror. And um, there's someone I'll introduce you to tomorrow morning um, uh, who was, whose career had already been launched to actually uh, by watching him and knowing I was working with him on, in a certain way uh, reassured me. But I remember in 1979 wondering whether I could do real reporting on television, a real documentary, and I saw a program on uh, public television called World. Uh, it turned out to be the predecessor to Frontline. And on that uh, program, uh, there was a documentary that was called Hot Shells. It was about how the South African government had uh, conspired to get around the arms embargo on South Africa when it was an apartheid regime. And tonight we have two people who were involved in that documentary here with us this evening. That documentary, when I saw it, convinced me that you could do real reporting on television and actually make it digestible. And maybe I should stay in the business. One of the people who's here tonight is the producer of the documentary, Bill Cran, who's sitting over there. Bill Cran. And uh, he's visiting with us in uh, Berkeley at the investigative reporting program, uh, possibly for the rest of the year. I don't think he signed on originally for that. Uh, and with, with the backing of Frontline. And before we get into the documentary we're going to broadcast, I wanted to introduce you to the executive producer of World, who became the executive producer of Frontline, who I last described publicly as the last man standing from the world of when television news was really news, David Fanning. And he's going to talk for a bit about the art of documentary filmmaking before we get into the film in question. David? Oh, he decided, not, not being a producer, he decided to sit way up there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lo. Oh, you know, before you have to say anything, let me just thank, there's a number of federal officials here this evening. Um, Please identify uh, no, that's, no, no, I want you to know something. They, they came up to me and they told me that they're here, they've been here in years past, and they're here despite the fact, I didn't understand that this is a, a side effect of sequestration, yeah. that in order to be here, they paid to be here out of their own pockets. So a round of applause. For David. Thank you, Lowell. Um, this is, uh, I feel like this is the, uh, the assignment from Professor Bergman for this evening was for me to, uh, uh, Janice Huey uh, announced to me that uh, I was uh, to give a, a talk of some six to eight minutes, I think, or something like that, and she'd already picked out a title for me called The Art of Documentary Making. So I just let that be and thought, well, I'll have to try to see if I can think and talk about that idea. Um, in a way, it's sort of a, a life's journey in six to eight minutes. Um, so here goes. Um, uh, once upon a time. They always start with once upon a time, by the way, I tell people in documentaries, and they always have three acts. 
So, um, and, the, and you should always have a good title and know what your ending is. Then you, the rest all fits inside of that. Um, I grew up uh, amongst books and boats. My mother uh, went to the library every second day in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, to, uh, to bring books back from the library. She read only biography and nonfiction. And uh, those were the only books in the house because my parents were school teachers and there wasn't money to buy books. And so those were the books I read. My father built boats. He built wooden boats beautifully. He put pieces of wood together. And because he didn't have much money, he always found pieces that he'd used somewhere else and fitted them and joined them. And I spent a lot of time in his workshop and around the making of boats. In some ways, I think that those two things come together in the work I do. I loved the making of films. I liked the joinery. I liked the fitting together of pieces that are somewhat haphazard, the pieces that you find when you make a documentary, which are the pieces that are the accidents of discovery on the road when you go out and shoot, that people tell you things you didn't expect them to tell you, and you find fragments of stock footage that you never knew existed until you find them, and somehow in the alchemy of putting those things together, you make a documentary. The art, the high art of doing the documentary is this particularly difficult business of making a really fine documentary work. It's unlike a feature film, a dramatic film, which has a script, and they live or die by that script. A bad script very rarely makes a good film. A good script does make a good film at times. But, but this is a particularly interesting and, and difficult art, and I was very lucky to find myself making my first film in Soweto in 1970 um, with, with a couple of friends and a borrowed camera and uh, a few rolls of 400 foot rolls of 16 millimeter film. And, and what I remember most vividly about that was the preciousness of that roll of film. And you put it into the magazine, into the camera, and switched it on, and it ticked over. And you, it was, of course, your own money, so you know, it went sort of nickel, nickel, dime, dime, quarter, quarter. Uh, as it rolled, and so you had to think very hard about when, when you turned it on and when you turned it off, and when you, where you put the sticks and what you decided to shoot. The image was precious, and, and in that preciousness uh, there was also this other thing I encountered, which was, as a young print journalist who had found and stumbled my way into doing that, that in fact uh, it had to somehow serve the idea. So the idea and the image were really very precious and they came together. I, I left South Africa with my film under my arm and found myself in England um, uh, recutting it for the BBC with an old wizened editor, Bill Widnow, the type at Elstree, who um, I sat there trying to figure out my film and re-editing it and, and he had a, an old fashioned uh, carpenter's plumb bob you know, the heavy weight with a long string, and every now and then he'd reach down and he'd lift it up. Where's your line? Where's your line? You're, you're off, you're down somewhere else. Lift up the plumb bob for the line. Just follow the line, get your line right and do it. This craft, this business of being able to kind of get something to follow along a narrative and to stick with a narrative, to construct something, also had within it an extra the, 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 the challenge of figuring out how to join both words and pictures together. I was very fortunate when I, um, when I left uh, from, bounced out of London and made my way to California and started making films down in Southern California in a little television, public television station to make them. Uh, I, well enough, uh, apparently, for, to, be, to be invited to WGBH to come and start the series that was called World. And Louis Wiley, who was sitting right next to Bill, Fran and I, who, who was my first consigliere and partner and editorial partner in World, um, drew in from all over the world uh, the best documentaries we could find to start a new documentary series on international affairs. And we found and looked for producers who had this, uh, who had something very special in the work they did. And that extraordinary education in looking very deeply at films and being able to call up people and say, how did you do that? 
is the other great sort of lesson of the documentary art and craft, because rather like somebody stands in the Louvre and copies the brush strokes of a master, you look at very good documentaries and deconstruct them, you can see inside of them the particular uh, grammar and syntax of the documentary form. Now, I have four pages of five pages of this stuff. It goes on and on. <laughs> I, I, I realize now, briefly, that I can't actually sum this all up, other than to say that that experience took me deep into the experience of the classic documentary um, that was, in many ways, a literary work. Uh, the people who I found, whether it was Anthony Thomas or Bill Cran, people who were doing really fine work had come out of a, out of a literary uh, 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 background. They, had, uh, they thought in those terms. And not only did they think very carefully about the pictures, but they also did something which I would later apply in editing rooms again and again, and Rainey Aronson can testify this, to this because in her first documentary that she showed me a rough cut, I asked her to take her narration out which was to look at the film without narration, but to look at the, the arrangement of the pictures and the people and, and as they speak. And if you look, very, look at it that way, you can begin to see the sort of bones of the, of, the, of the dramatic narrative. Because the words, you shouldn't write first. The words actually should be the words that come last. The words are the most malleable of forms. You can put them into the spaces between the pictures. But actually, the construction of a documentary is really something quite artful, and, and, and it's the pictures that very often tell you what they want to do and where they want to be. Against the backdrop of all of that, you also have to construct a narrative that has intelligence and has also a different kind of, of uh, authenticity, which we should get to in a second. I'm going to jump right past the invention of world and, uh, and what turned into Frontline, because really there was something quite profound happened. Uh, as Frontline began, it was called the last best hope for the TV documentary, and it was true. It was the end of the documentary. Videotape came in, and it was an enormous destruction of, the, of film. Uh, linear editing, which was videotape, destroyed the sort of business of filmmaking, and out of it came a new kind of grammar that was the grammar of TV news and the grammar of the magazine report the kind of work that was inevitably needed words written between pieces of interview that were then layered and covered by pictures put in by an editor to, to cover that narrative. Those words were then locked in place and never really changed, no matter how often you came back and did it. And, and two phrases which are not allowed in editing rooms as far as I'm concerned, and anybody wants to make a documentary, is B-roll and bites. You don't put bites in, you actually ha do interviews and you find people and you don't use B-roll because you create sequences. But that, that was in fact the grammar of television news transported into, into uh, the, the, um, the magazine program and from that came a kind of a, a grammar and syntax that ultimately destroyed the documentary um, in many ways. So that when finally the digital revolution happened and cameras came, and the 400-foot roll of film was long gone, but in fact this extraordinary new uh, 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 technology arrived in our hands, which was both nonlinear editing and the small camera, the, uh, the digital camera, it allowed for a whole new reinvention of the documentary form. Now, it is, it, the very short version of this is that it has seen an extraordinary change in the ways in which people have captured images and how they put them together. One of the things it's done, I think, while it's spawned, of course, all sorts of amazing things like reality shows, you know, we've got our fill of, um, you know, people, uh, you know, cops in the bayou and alligator wrestlers in Brazil and, and, and stupid people doing really awful things, uh, or awful things doing, people doing really stupid things, but, we have a lot of that, but all of it captured now with the ability to be able to shoot for hours and hours and hours and go out into the world and to gather enormous amounts of material. That, that technology has changed entirely, I think, the grammar and the art of the documentary. The art of the documentary has now become the art of the editor. 
It is the editor that gathers so much of that material, so many hours and hours, of, and it is the editor who, under the sort of broad supervision of the producer, begins to kind of craft and internally put together sequences without really necessarily knowing why they were shot that way or where they were, but because they work together. And there is in, the, in that act of doing that and in the act of arranging uh, images and pictures to work them towards uh, a particular dramatic purpose that begins to undermine in many ways a kind of contract that you made once upon a time when you went out and put that camera on a tripod and decided very carefully what it was that you wanted to shoot and thought very carefully about what you wanted to edit and how you wanted to tell the story. Something has happened in the process that may have created all of of the reality TV, but it has also created some innovative and quite extraordinary films too, because people have the time and they have the private passion to spend it with stories that have actually yielded some fantastic films. But I think the challenge now for us, for those of us who've practiced this other form, which is the making of these films that are created in a, as essentially literary works, pieces that can stand the kind of scrutiny of the long um, narrative, who are more consonant with the, the, the New Yorker than they are with, with uh, the news program. Those works we still need to be able to make, but fewer and fewer people know how to make them. So our challenge, I think the challenge we now have as journalists and as people who care about this medium, is to go out and meet more than halfway this new technology and the people who are wielding it. I think the people who do shoot those films in the bayou do wonderful work. I think we need to work with them. I think we have to reach over to the people who are able to sort of take cameras into places that we haven't got to as easily and to, and to begin to forge a different kind of relationship, both grammatically with the sorts of films that are being made and insert into them a kind of layers of journalism and layers of narrative that means that we would be able to work with people that we haven't worked with together before. Because we have no apprentice system anymore, because the networks don't create documentaries, because there isn't a, um, uh, uh, a school that sort of, other than very few places here at Berkeley and a few other places that actually produce people who work with the kind of rigor that we expected, I think that this is an opportunity for us to have to find and forge new relationships. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff I thought I was going to say because I ran out of, out of time. Um, I believe I'm running out of time here. Uh, he's nodding, <laughs> nodding at me. But let me just say, and I think I just do want to just reach for something here in this, that I think that we do have to adapt, otherwise I think we won't be able to continue to make these films. I think that there is a further challenge to us, and that is that the other great technological disruption that is happening to the documentary is the iPad, is this new form of communication that I think is going to challenge us to come up with ways to tell our narratives that are integrating both the the narrative of, of, of video journalism and the power of print and the, the strength of graphic design and the three-dimensionality of, of, of the digital space to create a kind of form that's going to be a different sort of grammar. And it is going to be, I think, the great challenge for us to figure out how we do that and how we communicate in that form. because. The documentary is not going to go away. We will still want to have long and sustained and I think uh, dramatic uh, narratives. But we also need to figure out how we're going to be able to communicate with people in shorter forms and put them together. We do it because the pictures are precious. We do it because the words are precious. We do it because good ideas have shape and they need discipline. I think we can embrace, um, but we also have to be careful of the temptations of art. Thanks very much. Thank you.